So we are working through question one, and we are told that we have f of x is equal to one over three x minus one. And you can also see that I have a restricted domain, which is going to be very important for part two of this question. But for part one, all we need to do is simply find what our uh, derivative is going to be. And to do that, we're simply going to use our chain rule. We're going to use our chain rule to answer our very first question. Now, what I would first do is rewrite what my function is, and I would rewrite it like this. It's going to be 3x minus 1 raised to the negative 1. Now it's quite clear that I'm going to be using my chain rule. So the derivative is going to be the following. I'm going to bring negative 1 to the front. Then I'm going to leave what's inside my brackets the same and then I'm going to reduce my power by one, then I'm going to times that by the derivative of the inside, which is three, which means my answer is going to be uh, negative one times three is negative three over, I can now bring this down to the bottom and making sure I change my negative exponent to a positive one. So it's gonna be three X minus one, and now that's going to be two. And that right there is going to be my answer. Let's now look at the examination report and see how students did with this question. So let's come over here and let's just have a look. So as you can see, let's just make this a bit bigger and let's bring it over here. We can see that 67% of the state got this correct. So that's a very high percentage and it's what you would expect. This is the first question, it's pretty easy. The average was 0.7. As you can see, this is what we got. And now let's just read what the most common errors were. So the majority of students correctly applied the chain rule. Errors were generally arithmetic in nature or with the negative exponent. So making sure you don't make any errors with your exponent. Uh, but generally, most students recognize that this was the chain rule. So overall, the state did very well with this question. Perfect. Let's now move on to part two. So let's just clean this up and let's just put that over here again. Perfect, all right, so part two, what are we doing? We're now finding the antiderivative. So let's just write out what this is. So I'm finding the antiderivative of my function here, one over three x minus one dx. That's what I'm doing. Now, when we are finding the antiderivative of something in this form, in your mind, this is what you should be thinking. Well, I'm finding the antiderivative of something, and it, instead of putting three x minus one, let's just call it uh, just t of x. And let's just leave our numerator blank for the time being. What we know is that if our numerator is the derivative of the denominator, my answer is going to be log e of the absolute value of the denominator t of x in this case, and of course plus c as well because we're doing indefinite integration. So when my numerator is the derivative of my denominator, I know this is true. Okay, now there's something we need to take a note of and that's the fact that we have a restricted domain. The fact that we have a restricted domain is very important and the reason why is because we don't have to put in the absolute value signs. If we can picture what this graph looks like, uh, let me just quickly draw up some axes here. It's going to look like this. And then what I could say is uh, it's going to be a hyperbola. To find where my asymptote is going to be, I'm going to go 3x minus 1 and set that equal to 0. So 3x minus 1 equals to 0. So my asymptote is going to be at 1 third. It's going to look like this. So this is going to be x is equal to 1 over 3. Then it's going to be like this and it's going to be like that. That's a very bad drawing, but it's going to look something like this. But because we have a restricted domain, that means I am not going to consider this part. I'm only dealing with this part. So I'm only dealing with the positive region. That's why I don't have to worry about the absolute value signs. So it's really important that you take note of that. Okay, so now back to what we were doing. Uh, what we're going to have to do in order to answer this is make my numerator the derivative of the denominator. So what is the derivative of my denominator going to be? Well, it's going to be three. So that means I'm going to have to multiply my numerator by three to make it three. But then I would be changing what I have. So I'm also going to have to times it by one third as well. So I can just bring that to the front. So now what I have is a three here. I can now anti-differentiate this, so it's going to be a one-third at the front, 
And now it's simply going to be log e of 3x minus 1. 3x minus 1. And then I have this plus c as well. Now, because it's asking for an antiderivative, c would could just be equal to 0. And if c was equal to 0, my answer would just be that. So because it's asking for an antiderivative, I could say my c is equal to 0. So I could just write that as my answer. Now, there's also another way we could approach this question. So let's talk about that as well. Uh, let me call this an alternative way to answer it. So let me write here alternative. So you, of course, wouldn't do both. That would be an immense waste of time. And I'm walking through this question rather slowly. You would, of course, go through this far quicker. You should just be recognizing everything I'm saying here. Okay. Another way we could approach this question, let's just rewrite it. So it's 1 over 3x minus 1 dx. Up here, what we did is we changed our numerator, so it was a derivative of our denominator. But what if we instead changed the denominator here? So what if I took 3 out? Well, if I did that, what I would be left with is 3, then x minus 1 over 3. Now, I could take that 3, which is 1 third, I could take that outside of the integral. So that means what I would be left with is 1 over 3, 1 over x minus 1 over 3 dx. Now, why have I done that? The reason why is because the derivative of my denominator now would be 1. So I have satisfied this right up here. So now I could write my answer as 1 third log e of x minus 1 third, x minus 1 over 3. And let me rewrite that because that's kind of ugly x minus 1 over 3. And again, uh, my c is just equal to 0. It could be equal to anything, but because it's n, just make it equal to 0. That's the easiest thing to do. Uh, let me just highlight that. So as you can see, these are two ways you could answer this question. Let's now look at the examiner's report and see how the state did with this question. So let's come over here. Let's just bring this over here. All right, so as you can see, they've provided both these uh, alternative answers, which are this the same. If you were to graph both of these, they would be the same graph. So here we have one third log e 3x minus 1. That's that one. And this is the other one. Okay, let's read where people messed this up. So it says, there were various ways of expressing the antiderivative, with the above being the most common. The most common error was placing a constant 3 or 1 rather than 1 third in front of the log expression. Students should note that they could easily verify their answer by using the chain rule to differentiate their answer and checking whether or not this derivative was in fact the rule for f. So that's a really great idea. And the fact that only 50% of the state was able to answer this really shows you that you need those tools of verifying your answer. That's pretty bad. This is the second question of this exam. So this, this is the easy stuff. It only gets harder from here. So it says that we can verify our answer by um, using the chain rule. Where does it say that? Uh, using the chain rule. So let's do that. So if I was to differentiate this using the chain rule, well, I just leave my constant the same. Uh, using my chain rule here, I would keep what's inside the same and just differentiate the outside. Well, the derivative of log is simply going to be 1 over 3x minus 1. And then remember, my chain rule tells me I now times that by the derivative of my inside, which is simply going to be 3. And let me just write that as 3 over 1. Well, this 3 is going to cancel with that, which means I'm just going to be left with 1 over 3x minus 1. And hopefully you all remember, that is what I started one with, 1 over 3x minus 1. So by using the chain rule, by using the chain rule, I have verified that my answer is correct. And also note that if my c was anything, when I'm differentiating, the constant would just go away. Um, according to the uh, MAV solutions, you could have left c in, but I personally would not recommend it. Uh, it's asking for an antiderivative Therefore, just let c equal to zero. Just write your answer like that. Okay, so that's everything. 
We are now going through question 1b, in which we're told we have g of x is equal to sine of pi of x over x plus 1, and we need to evaluate that for the derivative of g at x equals 1. So the very first thing we're going to have to do is use our quotient rule in order to find the derivative of this. So I'm using my quotient rule here. I'm using my quotient rule. So what I like to do is just say, let this up here be u, let this be v. So that means u is going to be equal to sine of pi x and u dash is going to be, well, I'm going to use my chain rule here, which means I'm going to take pi to the front and the derivative of sine is cos and what's inside stays the same. And now I also have v. v is equal to x plus 1. The derivative of v is simply going to be 1. I know my quotient rule tells me the following. My quotient rule tells me low, uh, low d high minus high d low over low squared. So that is going to mean, I'm going to have the following, v is x plus 1, u dash is going to be this one right here, pi cos of pi x, then I'm going to subtract u sine pi of x, sine pi of x, uh, multiply that by v dash, which is just going to be 1. So I'm not even going to put that in there. Then I'm going to divide that by v squared. Well, v is x plus 1, so it's going to be x plus 1 squared. Now, most people forget to do this. Lots of people forget to actually now evaluate for when x is equal to 1. Lots of people just stop here, so don't be one of those people. We're now going to put in 1 into this, which is going to mean I'm going to get 2 here. Then I'm going to get pi cos. Uh, this will just now be pi minus sine of pi over... This is going to be 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 squared is 4, which means my answer is going to be 2 pi cos of pi is negative 1 minus sine of pi is 0, and then that's all going to be over 4. What I'm now going to do is say I have negative 2 pi on 4. This and this will be 1 and 2. So my answer is going to be negative pi on 2. That is my answer. Perfect. Let's now see how the state did with this question. So I'm going to come over here and let's come and see how the state did with it. Over here. Boop. All right. So as you can see, 50% of the state got the full two marks here. This was our final answer, which we got. And it says, though generally well handled, poor placement of or lack of brackets when using quotient rule or a combination of product and chain rule led to errors in evaluation. So be really careful of your brackets. It then goes on to say, other errors included the misconception that cos of pi equals 1 or misquoting the relevant differentiation rule, which is listed on the formula sheet. There is no excuse. Some students did not answer the question in its entirety, i.e. completely forgetting to evaluate g dash of 1. Don't be one of those people who forget to actually evaluate the question. Um, don't be one of those people. Okay, so that takes us through all of question 1 of exam 1 of 2019. Hopefully you found it useful and yeah, you found all this very manageable. The first page, you should really kind of find very manageable and easy and work through it really quickly. But we've taken our time with it and uh, I hope you found this helpful.